Okay, well, I want to thank everyone uh, for taking the time to attend our meeting tonight. Um, my name is Matt Schumann. I'm the town engineer in, in the town of Winchester. And uh, we've invited uh, the Mystic River Watershed Association and our consultant, uh, Weston Sampson, to give a presentation about an exciting project that we're undertaking. Uh, the project includes the installation of stormwater tree trenches, uh, stormwater trenches, which uh, provide infiltration and water quality benefits uh, for stormwater. Um, this is a, a partnership between the Mystic River Watershed Association, the town of Winchester, the town of Arlington, city of Medford and city of Woburn. And it's graciously funded by the EPA. Uh, with that, I'm gonna keep it brief and let uh, Andy Rissena from the Mystic River Watershed Association start with his presentation. Thanks. Great. And I hope everyone can hear me. I've had trouble with my mic, but I think I'm online. Well, welcome and thank you. And this is mainly a trend, uh, presentation about um, what is happening on the ground in Winchester over the next few months. But I wanted to kind of back out. Um, we thought it would be useful to back out and sort of look at the big picture, the installations we're talking about are fall in this category of green infrastructure. And you might ask why make green infrastructure in the first place? What what big problem is being addressed here? And um, kind of how does Winchester's piece fit into a bigger picture? Um, and so I wanted to start there and just remind folks that uh, uh, Winchester is in the Mystic River watershed. Um, uh, network of streams that end up and lakes and um, land area that drains to the Mystic River, um, ultimately. The river you know best is probably the Aberjona um, uh, that flows through uh, Winchester. And I've always thought it's sort of a geographic accident that there are lakes in the middle. Like this this all is one continuous stream and the Aberjona is very much part of the Mystic River system. Um, uh, I, whoops, sorry, sorry, hold on. Oh, you're seeing all my slides now. Um, uh, I was going to start with, and th this is sort of the biggest context. Um, the problem we're addressing is a problem that's not unique to, but but um, characteristic of urbanized areas. And you can think of the entire Mystic River watershed as a, uh, a highly urbanized area, including the, the more suburban and leafy um, communities like Winchester. Um, in If across the watershed as a whole, the watershed is 40, more than 40% impervious surface that is rooftop and asphalt. And if there's one variable that uh, fuels this slogan that I have, that cities change rivers, that is that the landscape scale changes we make when we build a city fundamentally change the way rivers and streams work. Sorry, I'm, for some reason, uh, I have a very temperamental computer today, excuse me. Um, uh, 40% of the land area of the whole watershed is covered with asphalt or rooftop. And this turns out to lead to a systematic um, set of problems that affect river, especially water quality, but many other aspects as well. Um, the hydrology and ecology of streams. Um, one specific pollutant, and it's the one that we're gonna talk about today is phosphorus, and I'll, I'll come to it. Um, but every water body in the Mystic River watershed is phosphorus impaired, and it leads to some negative um, ecosystem and even public health effects like this in the lower right-hand corner, uh, cyanobacteria bloom um, of in, in the Mystic in 2017, where the river turned pea soup green. Um, so, that pollutant, uh, uh, phosphorus, is a kind of, um, it's a kind of um, uh, 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 paradoxical uh, pollutant. It's 
absolutely necessary for life. It's in all our bones. It's in DNA. It's necessary for every cell on the face of the earth. But too much of it is in waterways, is can bring about negative ecosystem effects. And um, it's because phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in freshwater systems. If you add more phosphorus to the Aberjona River, you'll get more biological activity, which sounds good, except that the form it often takes is big algae blooms that when they die, pull water out of, pull oxygen out of the water column and can lead to low oxygen conditions and fish die-offs, can lead the sheer presence of more extra nutrients, leads to invasions of, of invasive plants as we've seen in the Mystic River. And as I said, one variety of organism that thrives in high phosphorus conditions is uh, cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria uh, um, blooms, big population explosions, lead leave um lead to a public health threat because they um they some species of cyanobacteria have uh toxins that are uh, harmful to human and dog health for instance so it it's actually it's a paradoxical but important pollutant and where the way it gets to the river is through the stormwater system and this is what we're going to be talking about the rest of today and the this um this is likely obvious to most people um I, I, i'm not sure before i started work in this domain that this would have been utterly clear to me that most water that most rainwater that hits a street and goes down a storm grate like this goes directly to a river without ever being treated or filtered or um essentially goes straight through that storm grate through a pipe network to the river and um, one consequence of that is that anything on the road that's efficiently washed into that storm grate is also carried unfiltered, untreated to the river. And that it's this dynamic that we that we are all collectively mm, trying to get our hands around. Um, one interesting thing, this is a slight um a slight diversion, but I, I thought it it might be um useful to see this this is an aerial view of winchester that's the high school in the center um judkins pond i think is that is the water body that's there near this blue dot and this is this is um a snapshot of a tool called stream stats at usgs where um in the implementation that's in the mystic river watershed um you can uh, I'll leave a longer description aside, although I will thank, I noticed Laura Schiffman is on this call, uh, formerly of DEP, now of EPA. She was instrumental in helping bring this, this um, tool to the Mystic River watershed. But you can click, uh, uh, let me just give you a tour of what you see. The orange dots are, are storm drains or catch basins where water goes into the road, into those, uh, into the pipe network. And the orange lines are pipe networks that carry water straight to the nearest water body. And so you can see there's a maze of hundreds of miles probably in Winchester of stormwater pipes underground unseen, um, constantly doing work in any rainstorm. Um, what's cool in this tool is you can click on a point like, and so, and um, the, you can click on the end of one of these pipe networks like this blue dot which I did and had the data processed by the tool. And you can see what land area goes to that um, pipe that you would see a pipe on the, on the water body with water flowing out of it when it's raining. And um, you might think, well, it, it's probably getting water from the immediate neighborhood, but it turns out when you click on that dot, which is now, this is now zoomed out, it's now in the bottom left of this picture, it's this entire area that drains to that pipe outfall on the on the river. And so any rain that and this could this is at least half a mile away, these these streets in in the upper part of this neighborhood. And so whenever it rains anywhere in this neighborhood, um, water is introduced into the stormwater network and emerges there at that blue dot in and so 
pollutants can be carried from a quite a long distance away to the river that's being affected. Um, it's, a, it's a cool tool. It's called stream stats at USGS if you want to play with it. Um, but I thought this gave a very good image of what's happening in Winchester itself. So we know that stormwater carries phosphorus to the stream, but where is the phosphorus coming from in the first place? Um, there's a kind of list of suspects here, common suspects or sources of phosphorus in urban environments. I, one thing I neglected to say is that it's characteristic of urban environments specifically, urbanized environments with a lot of impervious surface that they introduce a disproportionately high amount of phosphorus to streams. And that also kind of is kind of paradoxical. You can imagine why agricultural areas um, deliver a lot of phosphorus to a stream because people are spraying fertilizer everywhere and there's an excess of it and it makes its way to rivers, but it happens in urban areas too. And some of the suspects are frankly dog waste, which is why the dog is pictured there. Absolutely fertilizer application, commercial, um, a sort of institutional, commercial and private uh, application of fertilizer can bring fertilizer always has, well, not always, but um, often has phosphorus in it and uh, can be introduced into the stormwater system. But if there's probably one biggest factor, single biggest factor, it's organic material, think leaf litter in the fall, that's washed down storm drains and carried again, super efficiently and quickly to the river. If this were a forested environment um, with no pavement, leaves would fall to the ground and decay where they landed, more or less, and be recycled locally. If a leaf falls on a street, it's sent really quickly in a way that it never would be if this were a forest to the river. And so it turns out urban areas are introducing a disproportionately high amount of organic material directly to streams in the form of leaf litter, for instance. So keep that image in mind as this material decays and breaks down into small particles, all of that is being washed in rainstorms to the river. And it leads to those negative effects that we were talking about. Um, and so the Mystic River Watershed Association, along with many partners, including DEP and US EPA and every municipality in the watershed has been engaged in a several year program to do science around phosphorus, figure out how much is going in and how much would have to be avoided in order to bring about uh, positive results. And EPA and DEP have engaged with municipalities and we're now in this kind of um, last segment of this timeline where we're doing work on the ground that's meant to address this problem. And that's what we're here to talk about tonight. And I, I'll, I'll mention that there was a report published in the course of this many years of work um, by EPA and DEP called the so-called uh, Mystic River Alternative TMDL for Phosphorus. Um, and it is a report that had two big findings. One is that most, the vast majority of phosphorus making its way to the river as a pollutant, it comes from stormwater, that is from rainwater as we've been talking about. And the second is that to achieve um, ecological um, water quality uh, targets that bring about ecological health in the rivers, a 60% reduction in stormwater, uh, in the amount of phosphorus in stormwater would have to be removed. Uh, the, a 60% reduction is necessary. That's a big, tall order. And it's what we're all uh, kind of engaged in collectively um, as we move forward. So uh, the next question, of course, is what can you do about it? What kinds of tools are there to effectively, it, most of these things are effectively filters for phosphorus. You're trying to catch phosphorus before it gets to the river. Um, the biggest, and there's this toolkit of, of devices and strategies called green infrastructure. And the biggest example, probably, and maybe most picturesque is the, is this, Cambridge stormwater wetland at Alewife Brook, where uh, sewer separation led to a bunch of new stormwater being introduced into the Alewife Brook. And they created a big wetland, water meanders 
through this material um, uh, falls out of the water column and is captured by this wetland, um, the plants filter the water, and then the uh, egg, the water exits and enters Alewife Brook. But it's three acres, and um, there are precious few um, uh, opportunities for three acre sized um, uh, green infrastructure uh, installations in the mist in the heavily urbanized Mystic watershed, and so everyone's toolkit turns to small scale solutions, and some of them are um, look like the the device on the left, which is kind of like a rain garden with its catching water from the road uh, and or from the sidewalk, uh, mo likely in this case from the road as well, and um, is allowing water instead of going into a pipe directly, it's giving some open space where water can infiltrate into the ground. The solution that we're going to talk about today when it's finished looks like the picture on the right. It actually gets paved over. Well, actually, I'll, I'll, there's a nuance here in Winchester that, that I'll let folks talk about. Um, but it's an underground trench that um, that uh, allows, but still the principle is the same. It allows water to infiltrate. And just to give you an idea of how this works, we thought we'd show you this cutaway of the standard design for these things that were pioneered in Arlington in collaboration with EPA and the UNH Stormwater Center. And if you look at the top diagram, that's the view of the road from above looking down. And number two is a storm drain where the water from the street that when it rains goes down this drain. And usually what happens is, and what's below it is can be seen in the diagram below, which is the cross-sectional view of the same thing, right? Is a catch basin that is this column this um, cylindrical uh, container that catches the water. Um, but when water reaches the pipe number three on the top, um, ignore number one for a second. When the pipe, when water reaches pipe number th three, it flows out into that stormwater network and then out to the river. The trenches that we are uh, designing uh, that, th that the town of Winchester is designing and implementing involve digging a trench, literally a, a deep hole in the ground, um, to uh, on the other side of the of this catch basin, with a pipe, a perforated pipe that allows water before it reaches pipe number three, as rain falls, starts filling up this this container, and water goes first into pipe number one. And what happens is uh, that storm water, as it's raining, um, goes into this gravel-filled trench um, that's put in soils that are allowed that um, allow a fast uh, infiltration of water. And as much as it can, it allows water. It diverts water to the left into this um, into the area. Whoops, into the area. Uh, labeled one here. If the rain is falling hard, it li likely that will fill up pretty quickly. And uh, the fail safe here is that water will then reach the next pipe, pipe number three and go off to the right. And so what this device does is divert and infiltrate the first kind of flush of water that comes in a storm. And the, the secret power of these small, inexpensive, um, uh, relatively inexpensive cost-effective things is that by diverting the first bit of a storm, you divert, it turns out, a disproportionate amount of phosphorus. And so it's a very cost-effective tool. Um, they their, their downside is that they're small. And so if, the, um, if it makes sense to build these things, it makes sense to build a lot of them. And so that's what collectively we've all been doing in the or the municipalities, uh, we were we're along for the ride as cheerleaders and grant writers um, and project managers, but not as as people doing work on the ground. This is all done by municipalities. This started as a pilot project in Arlington. It moved to Lexington. This project is now in Winchester, Medford, and Arlington, and now it includes Woburn. And we 
did work to plan and um, design uh, locations for 200 plus more trenches over the next few years. And we're getting additional funding, including federal funding coming in to pay for these structures. And so the vision is to take these small cost-effective things and scatter, scatter them across the landscape, helping water move the way it used to before we paved over the surface. Um, and so that's the big picture. That's why we're, we're doing what we're doing. And with that, I think I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, and thank you to the town for having me here tonight. My name is Dorit Schwartz. I'm from Weston and Samson. Um, and as Matt mentioned, we're the consultant that's assisting the town with the design um, of the infiltration trenches, the siting and design, I should say. I need to share my share screen here. Hopefully everybody can see that okay. Um, so first we're just gonna talk a little bit about the project background, um, provide a little insight into how these trenches were sited, um, and then talk, provide an overview of the design and construction, and then talk about the timeline for installation. Um, so Andy provided a really great kind of overview talking about um, kind of the different nutrient impairments, um, as it relates to Winchester's receiving waters. Um, again, you know, the entirety of the town is located within the Mystic River watershed. Um, the Mystic River does have an impairment for phosphorus. Um, so basically, you know, all of the town stormwater is, is, like we said, heading to the Mystic River. But there's also other um, impaired receiving waters in town as well, including the Aboriginal River, the Wedge Pond, and Winter Pond, which all have nutrient impairments as well. Um, so basically all of these, these receiving waters are, are listed on the state's um, integrated list of waters. So they're basically not meeting water quality standards, um, not meeting designated uses for, for various constituents. And again, nutrients is what we're kind of um, focusing on here tonight. Um, so basically, I know Andy kind of gave a nice overview of what a catchment area is, but on the right here, basically you can see kind of a snapshot of the town's drainage system. Uh, you can see kind of the catch basins, drain manholes, and then we have an outfall here that discharges to the average zona. But basically all of this shaded area has been delineated um, based on topography and the town's drainage infrastructure to determine kind of what is the kind of the contributing catchment area to this outfall. Uh, and so back into 2022, we actually looked at the phosphorus loading that was associated with all of the different um, drainage catchment areas in Winchester that are basically, it was a town-wide analysis, like we said, because as we know, everything eventually goes to the Mystic, which has that phosphorus impairment. Um, and so basically in, you know, what we're seeing with phosphorus loadings and basically in Winchester, the highest loadings are basically in those high density residential, medium density residential and commercial industrial land use areas. Um, so medium density residential is really the predominant land use in Winchester. Uh, and so looking about, you know, in terms of how we calculated the phosphorus loadings and what that, um, you know, what, what that entails. And it's basically looking at kind of the impervious surface area within each catchment. Um, it's looking at the soil type within each catchment and then and basically the land use area within each catchment to try to identify catchment areas that are contributing the highest phosphorus loadings. Um, and so as we move this project forward, um, like we said, the town of Winchester in conjunction with Myra is planning to construct up to 22 of these infiltration trenches. Um, so right now we're, we're looking at 22 infiltration trench locations. It doesn't mean that 22 trenches will be actually constructed in the end. Um, we're still working through the process um, of that. But right now we're, we're looking at 22 um, potential locations. And again, the benefit of these is that, you know, obviously the town doesn't have a lot of, you know, large available land space where we can site a, a very large system for phosphorus removal. Um, and so incrementally by installing these infiltration trenches, um, you know, we'll gradually be able to remove more and more phosphorus. And so we estimate that about, you know, a quarter to maybe like a third of a pound of phosphorus can be removed um, depending on kind of the size of each infiltration trench. And so this kind of, um, so basically the preliminary trench locations were chosen based on the following criteria. 
Um, basically, like I said, we did that phosphorus loading analysis. And so the goal was to really try to cite some of these trenches within those high phosphorus loading catchment areas. And you can kind of see those at right in this map here, those, those areas that are shaded um, kind of in, in purple here are the high phosphorus loading catchment areas uh, where we're showing the red dots right now. Those are the kind of the proposed preliminary infiltration trench locations that we're currently looking at. Um, again, and some of these are, you know, cited outside of those locations um, strategically based on, you know, properties within those areas. Um, and so in addition, obviously, this is really a water quality driven product, project, but I also wanted to mention, obviously, incrementally, the, the hope is that also it, it does provide a little bit of a flood kind of reduction benefit overall as more of these infiltration trenches are, are cited. And I know there's been, you know, there's some flooding issues around the high school and stuff. And so we're trying to be strategic about that as well in terms of how these are cited. Um, so in, in looking at, you know, what is the ideal site for one of these trenches, um, we're looking at the type of soil that's located in the area. Um, so obviously you want well-draining soils that are gonna infiltrate. Um, and so we did do a desktop analysis to look at soil suitability. Um, and then it's also based on, of course, all of the historical knowledge based on all the other work that the town has done. Uh, you know, there's some level of understanding that engineering and DPW has regarding where um, kind of the best soils are located within town. So applying that knowledge and then also looking at depth of groundwater, obviously we want, you know, we want to, you know, enhance infiltration in these areas or we don't wanna cite these in areas where we will have a high groundwater table as well. Um, and so, you know, looking at those characteristics again, based on historical knowledge um, from, from the town as well. Um, and then thinking about utility complex, obviously we wanna kind of maximize, you know, the footprint um, of these trenches. And we of course wanna avoid utility complex in the field. So we're looking at where other existing utilities are located that are gonna limit the footprint of these trenches. Um, and so we do, we did collect some detailed information related to that that we've added to the plans. Um, and we're trying to, you know, pursue locations where we can again maximize that, that footprint um, and leave up these trenches and avoiding those conflicts. Um, and unlike that earlier example, I know Andy had mentioned that this project deviates a little bit from that. Um, so earlier on, you know, a lot of the projects, um, the trenches have been located in the, the paved right away. And so for this, this project, we're really trying to minimize impact um, by citing these trenches in the grass strips and the sidewalks. Um, and this, this overall kind of, you know, reduces the amount of restoration that will be required. Um, you know, of course, and we can put more of that money toward actually in some trenches and less, um, you know, and repairing the actual pavement. And, and so, and I, and I think, you know, just overall it kind of, um, you know, eases the kind of the design, the construction process. Um, so again, we, you know, we have these 22 locations that we're, that we're looking at, that we're working on designing, but um, we haven't finalized this list of locations. Um, you know, we're looking at what is going to be the cost to construct these trenches in each of the locations that have been selected to date. You know, where are we going to get the greatest phosphorus removal? Um, and then we're still really working to kind of just, you know, relook at site conditions as well. So related to that, um, that's that again. Okay, here we go. Um, so the town is looking to um, plan some test pits as well, just to confirm kind of soil suitability, confirm groundwater depths. Um, so there may be a test pit if you, you know, um, that may be performed in front of your property if one of the trenches is being cited um, near you. Uh, but if that happens, you will be contacted by the town. Uh, you'll get a notice uh, before the test pits begin. Um, and the, those test pits, again, are going to be also constructed in the grass strip um, as well. So, you know, minimizing disturbance initially in advance of construction as well. Um, and again, I know we've talked about this, but again, we're citing these in the sidewalk or the grass strips in town roadway layouts. Um, you know, again, with the goal, the goal of avoiding impact to existing roadways. Um, and everything will be restored as part of this process. Um, in terms of how long the work will actually take, um, Conservatively, we're thinking about usually it's about a day um, per installation of each trench. Um, but in some cases, contractors may be able to move through this work, uh, you know, more quickly depending on site conditions. And so, you know, in some cases, they may be maybe be able to install, you know, two or more trenches a day. But I guess conservatively, if, if construction is happening near your home, you should plan that the installation will take at least a day. Um, and then there may be some follow-up restoration work that occurs as well. So they may be coming back. For that as well, but it's but again, just not not a prolonged period of, of construction. 
um, at any of these locations. The work will move from um, and to the right here is just kind of kind of one of the locations that we're currently looking at. Um, this is Middlesex Street at, at Lake Street. Um, so you can see kind of the catch basin here and obviously the ample green space here that's available for, for kind of trench construction. We'll look at that a little closer on the next slide here. Um, so in this in this scenario, the infiltration trench is going to be constructed um, in the grass strip near this catch basin, kind of going toward this direction, which you can kind of see um, on this kind of CAD drawing that will be incorporated into our, you know, our design drawings, but shows kind of the layout of the of the actual trench. So at this proposed location, we're hoping to get um, 80 linear feet um, of, of 12 inch perforated pipe installed, um, kind of maximum, I think kind of this is the maximum trench length you'll see, really see as part of the project. Um, but again, you know, like we're trying to protect um, adjacent existing infrastructure as much as possible. So protecting existing curbing, removing, re resetting curbing and moving and seating. And so all this information will be detailed on the plans um, to ensure a successful restoration process. As far as the overall timeline goes, so the trench designs are currently ongoing. Um, like I said, the town is looking to perform some test pits eminently. Um, and then we're also working to convey all this design information and develop a cost estimate. Like I said, that will really inform which of the final trench locations the town is able to move forward with based on the available funding. Um, the project will be pub publicly bid. Um, thing like the project at the next you know month or so, um, and then you know we'll work through that process and and move forward to construction. Um, and the goal is to construct these infiltration trenches in the summer months. Um, and all work will be completed by September 30th, uh, as that's kind of the end of the, the grant uh, time time period that's available. So kind of just providing an overview. And this is actually kind of a, just an example, you can see here of construction of an infiltration trench. So just kind of provide some in, insight and, in, you know, what, what it's going to look like kind of during that kind of that process, based on kind of the detail that Andy had shared. And if anybody is looking for more information related to the project, just wanted to share the town's, um, you know, has a website set up for the project. If you're not familiar with that yet, we have that listed here. Um, and then just, of course, you know, obviously we're excited to answer any questions that the public has tonight, but if additional questions come up, just we have listed here the um, email address for the engineering department. So feel free to definitely reach out, especially if you have any specific questions. Um, and because you might have gotten notice that you're you're potentially within the within the project area. I think that's that all. Yeah, everything that I had. So yeah, looking forward to, to answering any questions that everyone has. Thank you, Doris and Andy, for a great presentation. Um, I also put the link to the town project page as well as the um email address for the engineering department. They're both in the chat so that you can have that um, so you can access both things. I also saw that there were some good um, questions coming in through the chat. I think Isaiah was monitoring. Um, are you able to take over and unmute people so they can ask their questions? Yes. So I think uh, perhaps what we'll do is um, we can have people raise hands um, and the way to raise your hand is to click on the uh, reactions button at the bottom of your screen and it should have a raise hand option there and then I can allow people to unmute based off of that. Um, and yeah, that's how we'll do the questions. Um, and Michelle, I see I see your hand. Um, so maybe we'll start with you and I'll try to incorporate some of the questions from the chat as well. So um, Michelle, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Mute. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm a resident um, in a community. We're about 30 houses and we're right off Mystic Street. Um, and the main road that goes into our community is um, a straight shot down into the lower Mystic Lake and upper Mystic Lake. I'm in Arlington. And as a community, we're trying to find ways to decrease the water that runs into the town. The, um, I'm sorry, <clears throat> as a community, we're trying to find a way that we can work together to decrease the water that runs into the, the lakes 
to decrease the phosphorus. And we've struggled to find um, contacts and funding. And the water doesn't really have anywhere to go except from all the neighboring houses straight down into the lakes. So we're trying to find a way to stop it at the bottom before it hits the lake. So my question is funding sources or people I should be contacting. I'm working with a group of residents to do this. I can jump in and offer um, just a couple of quick thoughts. One is, um, Thank you for knowing about stormwater pollution and for be, being um, uh, active about about uh, looking for solutions. If there's one town that's built more of these particular stormwater trenches than any other town in the Mystic Watershed, it's um, it's the town of Arlington. Actually, they they were the innovators at the beginning. Wayne Chenard in the town of Arlington uh, worked. Uh, on the initial designs and sort of um, protocols around these. And and so uh, a lot of work is being done uh, uh, sort of on the other end of town toward the toward the um, Alewife Brook. Um, the other thing I would say is that, and so whether these kinds of devices are suitable for that particular neighborhood is one question. Um, uh but there there may be there may be local solutions um that either the town could uh implement through outside grant funding or even even a local community group could could contribute i will also say that the vast majority of water that's coming to upper mystic lake if you think about just scale it we're always misled by our proximity to our own neighborhoods. Like we see the water going into the lake, but if right. you imagine where most of the water is coming from, it's from the Aberjona River, which which um, is draining the entire watershed above it. Right. So, like it's that inlet that it's it's almost like to avoid extra phosphorus in in Mystic Lake, you would work on the Aberjona River first. Oh, but okay. that's just an aside. Yep. Okay. And any sources of funding or people I should be contacting in addition to Wayne? I would start there and know that all of us are looking for funding. Um, we okay. have, uh, we, uh, we actually just got recent news that um, we'd, we'd, um, this was also a town of Arlington, actually, um, but on behalf of a, of a regional coalition of municipalities, got a federal earmark in this budget that just went through for building green infrastructure in the watershed through uh, Congresswoman Clark's office. So thank her as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And perhaps I'll elevate a couple of things from, from the chat, which seem uh, maybe there's some overlap, which is are there any planned uh, near the Mystic Lakes? Um, and then there's also a question about DCR and, and the Mystic Valley Parkway um, and whether uh, that um, whether there's cooperation there. Um, I'll, I'll, I guess I can jump in and I, I don't know of any um, specific um, local green infrastructure right in the neighborhood of Upper Mystic Lakes. But I I guess I would remind people again that water, because of the way these stormwater networks are connected, water travels very long distances across the landscape to water bodies like the Mystic Lake. So it's, it's almost less about what's going on on the road right next to Upper Mystic Lake than what's going in, in the area, the big area of land that's draining ultimately to Upper Mystic Lake. Great, thanks, Andy. I'll go to uh, to Brandon, who uh, has his hand up, and I'll uh, I'll um, ask you to unmute. Thank you, Isaiah. <clears throat> uh, this is Brandon Spirito. Um, I live on uh, Pond Street. Um, I was just wondering, um, is uh, street sweeping twice per year adequate enough for cutting down on pollutant loading? Thank you.
Thanks, Brandon. Is everyone? Yeah, Andy. I I can say my my two cents here. I suspect other people have th things to say. One thing we know is that um, I put in the chat some um, a reference to a paper, USGS paper on the effect of street sweeping in Madison, Wisconsin, on phosphorus loading in 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 the river uh, there. And um, one thing we know is that the new permits that come issued by EPA um, to mun municipalities will incentivize and reward um, uh, more intensive street sweeping, partly because of that science, um, fueled by that science, um, sort of uh, to, so that I think increasingly communities will get credit for um, for street sweeping as a phosphorus reduction tool. Uh, Matt, you may have uh, more to say about this as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with what you have to say, Andy, and, and certainly some areas get swept more frequently than others based on vehicle loading and, and land use. Um, you know, but it comes down to resources, right? You know, the town has limited resources and, and it has to do the best it can. So. All right, I think I'll elevate a couple, uh, another another question from the chat, which is, so there's a question that says, what happens with an oil spill, such as the one that occurred a couple years ago when a tanker overturned near the Mystic um, with these infiltration systems? And, and maybe that sort of gets at another question, which is, is, is there, uh, you know, a risk to the functionality of these systems if there's some sort of, you know, large scale pollution event like that? So I, I can I, I can answer it. I think the best thing would be as if the slide. I don't know if uh, if that was on your your slide, Andy. But these are the catch basins get equipped with uh, hoods, mm -hmm. and what the hood does is it 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 keeps if if there is any oil or a spill, it keeps that material in the catch basin rather than. Uh, going into the infiltration trench or into the downstream pipe. Um, that's kind of hard to visualize, but but that is taken into account. Yeah, that's a great reminder. Oh, and then uh, there was a second question <laughs> to that about, uh, to, can you refresh our memory on the second part yeah, of the question? Yeah, there's also a couple questions about, about flooding. One specifically asks about siting and whether the water table is is taken into account. Um, and then another just asked, and I think I think this was touched on in one of the presentations, but asked whether this uh, has has any uh, benefit toward preventing flooding. Yeah, so uh, again, kind of like Therese had mentioned is, you know, depth of water table is an important um, parameter. So you want to make sure that that the water table is low enough that that these will actually infiltrate that they won't get clogged um, and they won't tape water and send it downstream. So that's definitely uh, something that that uh, engineers in the town are looking at through our local knowledge and perhaps doing our test pits. Um, and I think the second question was related to flooding. And um, so we tried to give some consideration at uh, areas that were upstream of more localized flooding, I think, I, I'm not sure that this would be the tool, uh, you know, to solve Winchester's flooding problem, um, because as Andy said, they take such small areas and they tend to be very localized. Uh, but that is that was something we tried to consider in in, in citing these. Um, I, I would also say, you know, we're not, although though uh, through modeling and they can in simulation they can kind of identify what the expected phosphorus reduction would be from some of these there's we're not doing any kind of modeling of stormwater flows or any any reductions from from them I might just quickly take a stab at answering a question regarding the uh mystic lakes uh path project because that's something that I'm working on with mystic river um and the question is uh, there's a project to build a bike path along the parkway from West Medford to Bacon Street, um, and they'll be taking into account water drainage considerations. Um, but the presentation here did not make any mention of uh, infiltration along that pathway. 
Um, so I'm, I'm working on that with Mystic Rivers, uh, uh, Greenways program, uh, 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 program manager and, um, that project, so the, the drainage considerations uh, that are being taken into account there, and you know we're still working on the preliminary design, um, but it would be things like adding curbing where there isn't, isn't curbs already to prevent um, storm water from coming and eroding the pathway, um, but at the moment does not uh, include looking at um, infiltration trenches like the ones that are, are being discussed in the presentation today. Um, that being said, uh, you know, we're sort of still in the information gathering stage of that project and really want to hear feedback from the public. And so uh, you're more than welcome to uh, reach out to us about that um, if, if you think that's something that we should incorporate. Obviously, I can't guarantee that that's something that we will be able to incorporate into the design of that pathway. Um, but right now, the drainage solutions that we're looking at look more like sort of in incorporating additional curbing to prevent erosion um, and, and less about the, uh, the, the stormwater drain networks. And actually, I can keep elevating some things. So there's a question about tree species that work best um, in, in this setting. Is there a decision being made there? So our infiltration trenches don't include planting of trees. Uh, so I guess uh, I would say there's no decision to be made there. Um, in terms of like water quality, I'm not sure if the species of tree, if there's a variability in the type of leaf and how much phosphorus it could, you know, contribute. Uh, but there, we're, we're not planning on planting any trees. Certainly if there's an abutter on the call that, that's interested in having a tree planted, that's something that we could talk about um, with DPW. Um, another question from the chat is, uh, the restoration of soil promotes using leaf litter for your yard and garden. Um, so is the uh, sort of phosphorus pollution risk uh, related to leaf litter, um, you know, an indication against that, that you shouldn't use leaf litter in your yard? Um, I'm going to eagerly jump in here <laughs> and say, oh, no, just the opposite. Like, the, the best thing you can do is keep leaves on your property um i know there's a limit to that on small yards and and um and so forth but but it's it's only when the material is on the road and is swept to the into the storm drain by rainwater that this is a factor leaving it in in your yard is exactly um uh this is me editorializing but like the best thing you can do with leaves Great, thanks, Andy. Tracy, I will. I'll call on you. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay. Um, thanks so much for this really informative presentation. I was wondering about the long-term maintenance of these infiltration trenches. Um, are they more or less expensive to maintain than a regular catch basin? Um, and is that um, maybe would sway the town if it's less expensive to put in more in the future. Thanks. So I, I guess I, I can take that. Um, so these will be inspected every every year. And basically what the inspection uh, will look at is, uh, are they still functioning in terms of draining water when after a rainstorm, we go and look and we make sure that they're, that they're draining. Um, this is actually a retrofit on an exi on existing catch basins. So we're not putting new catch basins in, it's sort of an enhancement of existing catch basins. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that there's a really a cost difference. I, I'll say that I, I put these in, in another community I worked in and you know the oldest ones were maybe like five, six years and we hadn't had to do any maintenance on the trench itself. Uh, every year, the catch basin has to get cleaned to make sure that any materials in it uh, get, gets removed and doesn't make it into the trench. But, uh, you know, they seem to be working pretty well, at least in the short term. Thanks, Matt. Um, let me look. In, so I'm, I'm seeing that there's been some photos sent in the chat just showing the condition 
uh, specifically with respect to to sediment of a of a of a storm drain. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone wants to comment about sort of um, uh, sediment at the Chesterford Great. Yeah, Andy, I think this is a great opportunity to plug the Adopt a Storm Drain program that Mystic River Watershed Association helped us put together. Please, yes. <laughs> I, I can yeah. do it, or, or you can do yeah. it. Yeah, there, there's, so we, we um, through funding from the State Department of Enver uh, Environmental Protection, um, um, members of our Mystic River Stormwater Collaborative um, uh, all joined this program that was first in our watershed in Medford, but now is in multiple municipalities where you can, um, it's sort of like a crowdsourced uh, education effort about stormwater, but also um, a, a kind of crowdsourced, um, uh, uh, you know, a small scale management uh, pr program as well, where you can go online um, and I'll, I'll put the link in the chat and literally, um, you know, uh, quote unquote, adopt or, or claim a drain and say, I'm going to, if I see conditions like that of leaves occluding the, the drain and might maybe causing flooding or trash accumulating, that I can remove it and, um, you know, play a small part. We're, we're, it's not an effort to put the onus on residents to, to maintain the system, but more like a um, education effort to say, don't take for granted this, this infrastructure that's under the ground that's making our cities work. Like that's one thing to say about this stormwater network that, you know, um, if we paved over the cities and didn't have working stormwater networks, the cities would be flooded. And and so there's a huge investment uh, in infrastructure, and this is a kind of window into it, but I'll put the link in the chat. And Brandon, Thanks, I Andy. apologize. I'm, I'm, sorry, go. I, I, I just, I was going to say, Brandon, I missed your hand. Is there any other context that you wanted to add? I'm sorry, this is actually Laura now. Brandon had to go upstairs. Um, and I, I'm not going to speak to this for some reasons. That I think that Andy and Matt understand. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was just going to add in terms of, you know, concerns related to street sweeping or, or, or clogged catch basin grates, certainly contacting the DPW uh, is the best way if you, if you want that to be addressed. All right, I'll go to Todd and I'll ask you to unmute. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I live, I'm Todd Gulick. I live on Everett Avenue near Cambridge Street. Uh, with respect to the last comment, uh, this would be directed to uh, officials uh, in town here. There are quite a few streets in this town that are private ways. It's a uh, unusual Massachusetts, I think, specific thing. They're not actually private streets. They're private ways. And uh, a lot of these are not maintained by the abutters, which is an obligation that they have and the town lets them skate on this. So um, many of the catch basins on these private ways uh, are heavily damaged. They're never cleaned or if they are cleaned, they're done so by DPW at town expense, which is actually not the way things are supposed to operate. And they are a major source of uh, flash flooding in low-lying areas in town. So they contribute to your uh, concern regarding phosphorus and also flooding problems. And the town has let them skate for the 30 years I've lived here. Um, in a related question, I understand that the focus here is on phosphorus delivery to uh, the uh, downstream in the watershed, but I, I'm wondering if there has been, let's uh, see, it wouldn't be cost benefit, I guess a cost effectiveness analysis. So for example, is the money that's being spent here as effective in, in reducing phosphorus as paying someone to clean the catch basins on a routine basis, enforcing uh, the cleaning and maintenance of uh, drainage facilities along 
uh, or on uh, private ways or uh, taxing people for introducing impervious surface, which is like a hobby in this town. Um, so has there been a, a modeling that says that this is the best way to address this particular problem? Thanks. So I'll definitely acknowledge uh, some of the issues with private ways. That's certainly not just a Winchester issue, but but something uh, that is notable. Uh, with regards to cost benefit, um, I'm not aware of any studies. I don't know if you are, Andy, comparing uh, kind of uh, uh, green infrastructure, sort of an infrastructure uh, installation versus a, a maintenance installation. But I think it's always important to consider you know maintenance while these while the green infrastructure certainly requires inspection and maintenance you know the maintenance of uh street sweeping and and leaf litter collection and uh, uh um, removal of sediment is an ongoing maintenance cost so you know i think those are things as as the research continues that, that those are good things to be to be looking into i'd love to see some more information on that yeah, if I could add just one thing to that, which which is exactly right. Um, one, the, the grant that funded this um, this project in Winchester, the three nineteen program, which is federal money, it's money from EPA, but it it comes through the state. It's administered through the state Department of Environmental Protection. So, thank you to them as well. Um, they they grade proposals in in a way that not all, only on this criteria but like number of dollars per pound of phosphorus removed is a is a criterion like the the lower you can keep that dollar amount and one reason that the the program is is excited about these devices and they they tell us that they are is that they are very cost effective compared to other kinds of green other on the spectrum of green infrastructure installations they're at the very cost effective side because they we they're optimized for um again that first flush of water but also for minimizing construction costs um so that's one thing to say another is that the EPA permit the the regu the you know clean water act incentivizes and requires even municipalities to clean their catch basins, all those that all that maintenance and to uh, report street sweeping as well, so that um, all of those activities are incentivized. I actually asked the question, so we heard a set of presentations at a recent Mystic Steering Committee meeting on street sweeping and the promise of it as a means the the trick is the devil's in the details because it's not just any street sweeping it's high intensity street sweeping that's catching very small particles and and um so but studies have been done and they are continuing to be done and th i couldn't get the the presenter to say yes it is more cost effective than the best green infrastructure you know green infrastructure installations but he hinted at that and i think Stay tuned. There's more to come about that, but everything's a trade-off, and everything requires resources. And as a organization, we we um, are aware that stormwater um, spending on stormwater is probably across all municipalities in our wonder, watershed. Arguably, um, could use more robust investment if we want to bring about positive envir environmental change in the river. Uh, I'll bring another question from the chat. Uh, are there alternative designs, uh, for example, open infiltration pools at the outfalls that are being considered? So, I, you know, there are a variety of different ways to do this so i think it depends on the situation uh you know this this grant is specifically for green infrastructure as andy andy mentioned and and looking at these infiltration trenches but you know i, I think uh, also the comments from from the presentation is a lot of these other ones take up a lot more space 
particularly if you're doing it uh, at an outfall at the end of a pipe to get to get any meaningful reduction takes up a lot more space. And then another question from the chat is, uh, what happens over time to the phosphorus that is is filtered into the soil? Does it break down or does it simply accumulate there? That's a, a great question. And I don't know if you know the answer to this, uh, Andy. Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer. Uh, I know part of it is that the chemistry of phosphorus is very, very complicated. And there are a variety of different kinds of phosphorus and some dissolve, some in sediment, some adheres. Uh, I don't know if there's any, if, if you know anything more about that or, or you, Jerice. I'll, I'll defer to juries here, um, uh, but I, I could I, I could say what I think, which is I uh, my go go to explanation, as I put in the chat, is that phosphorus, unlike nitrogen, the 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 forms phosphorus tends to take in the environment. Um, um, uh, the material, the molecules um, bind ed adsorb to soil and silt and clay particles quite readily as opposed to nitrogen which moves rather more freely through the through groundwater um one just anecdotal piece of evidence that phosphorus can accumulate locally in soil is that i had my soil to i live in cambridge and i had my soil tested for just my garden soil tested and the the test came back and that you know uh, typical or urb, very urbanized area. Um, I hadn't applied ph phosphorus, but um, somebody had over time, and they the results came back sky high for phosphorus. And they said, whatever you do, do not apply more phosphorus to this soil. It has plenty, and you're going to actually have counterproductive effects. So, but that's an anecdote. Yeah, no, I was just going to say um... That is a great question. I don't have the answer to that, but it's definitely something worth looking into because um, that's that's an interesting question. But um, I guess one other thing, too, I just wanted to comment on a um, question earlier about, you know, thinking about street sweeping, catch basin cleaning and other structural control measures that can be used, other green infrastructure for phosphorus reduction. You know, we're working with a lot of communities that are required to develop what's called a phosphorus control plan. Um, and I'd say for them and looking at the required phosphorus load reduction, um, right now, I mean, it's kind of all hands on deck. They're considering everything they can to kind of meet the required reduction target. Um, and so right now it's not like, you know, just street sweeping or catch basin cleaning is going to be able to, to meet that alone. Um, and, you know, like Andy said, maybe there'll be more credit, you know, provided by EPA and, and that might change things a little bit, but I, I still think it's just going to be, yeah, moving all of these kind of, um, you know, best management practices, structural, not structural kind of forward to kind of you know, help alleviate, you know, and improve water and alleviate the amount of phosphorus, reduce the amount of phosphorus and improve overall water quality. Great. Uh, I'm seeing two questions in the chat about specific locations. Um, one is about the, the leaf pile uh, at the transfer station um, and whether any runoff from that is being filtered. And then another is about the Winchester Golf Club where it enters the, the upper Mystic Lake. So uh, the leaf pile at the transfer station, I believe, and I'm relatively new here, so uh, bear with me, but I believe that drains to a swale, which is probably not as efficient at removing phosphorus as, say, uh, you know, an infiltration trench, but does provide some uh, settling and some nutrient removal before it, it, it leaves the site. Uh, the one interesting thing about the transfer station is, you know, folks might know, it's also called the old incinerator site, uh, and a lot of areas uh, of it underneath were were used uh, for for uh, um, for for disposal of waste, um, and which really limits. You know, we didn't really talk about that inner siting, but certainly if you have a, a site that's contaminated or has bad fill, um, an infiltration device wouldn't work. Um, and as far as Mystic Lake, I don't, I don't know 
if Jerice has any more information on that. I don't have any specific information about phosphorus pollution in that, that area. Yeah, I can certainly follow up further on the analysis kind of that we did in that area and what the findings were. Um, and I can certainly circle back on that. I'm seeing another question about, um, is, is there a variance in the outfalls that might provide evidence of phosphorus sources? So I, you know, I'm, I would say based on my limited knowledge, I think it's a, a little inconclusive because of the variability and the types of storms you have. Uh, the variability is, uh, um, uh, Andy kind of said that, you know, when, when it rains, kind of, we talk about that first flush of rainwater takes a lot of the pollutants out, right, out of the, out of that material. And then as the storm goes on, it, the pollution tends to, or the amount of pollutants tends to be reduced. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not really sure that, that, that there's an, an answer for that, or that if you, you know, doing, doing the level of sampling that, that a municipality might do would give you a, uh, you know, we'll give you a conclusive answer. Yeah, I was just going to say, we've obviously helped the town with some sampling, and there has been some sampling for phosphorus at certain locations during wet weather, but really it's just kind of one discrete point in time. And so it doesn't provide too much of an overall picture um, at this point. And it's really one of, I'll just add, um, this observation that it's one of these like ubiquitous pollutants. Um, I think it's well, so there may be some local areas that contribute relatively more, but it's, you shouldn't think of it as like, um, like an oil spill, like there's one source that's pumping phosphorus into the system. It's very diffuse and it's coming off every impervious surface in the, in the watershed. I think I see one more question in the chat, um, which is that the golf course was following a green certification program that was reviewed by CONCOM. Um, do, do we know if they're still doing that? Yeah, I, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, perhaps the conservation administrator might know. And I'm seeing another one that's asking, um, mm -hmm. talking in more detail about the target areas for the for the for the trenches. Therese, perhaps you could could take that one. Yeah, I mean, as far as the target areas, are you? I don't know if that question lends itself more to like where are the precise locations at this point. I know Matt, we talked about you know, how we're still finalizing those, but plan to make that information available as soon as those are kind of set in stone. Um, or if you're asking more about, um, you know, the selection selection process, I guess, and what went into that. And again, the, the selection process was kind of like what we, what we kind of had talked about, um, you know, looking where we had, you know, you know, the right soils, um, the right, you know, depth to groundwater, ample depth to groundwater, um, you know, avoidance of utility conflicts and and again trying to trying to look at those high phosphorus loading catchment areas and prioritize those to the extent kind of feasible. All right, I'm seeing a question that says, uh, does stormwater that runs through marshland reduce uh, phosphorus content? thinking about um, the winter pond stormwater that goes through the, the Greystone Marsh area. Yeah, uh, unfortunately that's well beyond my area of expertise to say, talk about. I'm seeing a hand. Uh, 
Hi there. I'm Ann Storr. I am actually on the Winchester Conservation and I'm the uh, president of the Friends of Winter Pond and there's some folks on the pond. And so the question is we get stormwater coming down off of from above Mahoney's from Carriage Lane and down in there and then it goes under um, Cambridge Street. It goes to the area behind the the, the Aberjona, the, the nursing home there. And then it goes into the marshland and goes quite a bit into um, before it gets to actually Winter Pond. So we always wonder, do we target that community for education or is it not really gonna impact us? So we're never sure what to do there. That was that question. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't yeah. have an answer for that. Any ideas, Andy? I know we've chatted, you've been helping us sometimes. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have great anything anything interesting to say. I mean, the the only analogy I can think of is I, I bet I bet the processes are complicated. Like I don't know whether whether a, a, a like an established marsh is exporting or is it sink or source of phosphorus like overall like on average i don't know but the, the you know the the stormwater wetland at um but that's different it's an engineered structure um that utilizing wetland plants um and but importantly having soils in there that are that are uh effectively trapping right. phosphorus as well so it, um, it was a it was part of the pond historically many I see. Years ago. So now there is a structure in there that's a storm catchment. So the pipes come in and the mm -hmm. pipes are corroded and broken and the stormwater. So you know that if it was built in the 1920s or 30s, right, that water is just going all into the ground. So I'm thinking that from an education and a, a focus, we kind of can ignore it because it's going to get filtered by the time it actually gets to the big winter pond. Does that make sense? Or, you know, yeah. kind of think about that. But yeah, I mean, I, th so, I think it does. Yeah. Go ahead. All right, and the next question goes kind of to Matt. You recall we just put in through VHB that new stormwater um, catch basin that it's, it catches Chesterford and Woodside and it dumps into Little Winter, but the ponds are connected. And so I noticed you had two targeted, which would be great. I'd be all for it. But I just wondered if you factored in, um, Ms. Schwartz, the, the fact that we just put in this new swirl. It's a ton of sediment drain that, swirls the water before it drains it's a little more advanced than a typical deep sump yeah so i, I can answer that just because i i probably know a little bit more than uh, than jerice about the situation but but in general um what was put in uh it really is uh, more effective at trapping sediment and doesn't necessarily trap all the phosphorus oh, got it. Okay. Uh, that, you know probably removes some that's attached to the the sediment as andy said it just uh, phosphorus comes in so many ways shapes and forms mm -hmm. but the infiltration trenches uh i i would expect would remove more more phosphorus than than that's, the separator that's great thank you matt that's exciting and we've been looking kind of at the the, the last sediment drain on Pond Street and whether we should be putting in a new sediment drain there. And then you've kind of gone around most of Winter Pond, except for the part that's above Mahoney's. And that's kind of the last one we wanted to look at the impact if we looked at that drain. And is there a simpler solution that's less expensive in terms of design fees? Something we could put it on Pond Street, which does, as Brandon said, gets enormous amount of sand and silt from that state road. I don't know if it's state road, but it's a very busy road. Thanks so much, Anne. Um, so we have a question that is relating to it, it's sort of how does the town of Winchester compare to other towns that are are, are and municipalities that are participating in, in this program, both in terms of um, the uh, uh, the amount of phosphorus coming into into the watershed from Winchester, um, but then also thinking about um, what what is the reduction percentage of phosphorus that has has come from towns that are already participating, and do we have uh, any knowledge of that? I was I, just going to say, oh, sorry, Andy, you want to go no, ahead? No, please, please. No, I was just going to speak to. I know I we work with Arlington as well. I know that they've and like you had highlighted, Andy. I think they've installed like ninety or so infiltration trenches, and I know. Um, again, I think each of them has about a quarter to a third of a pound of phosphorus removal. So, um, so I, I mean, I think through the infiltration trenches, um, you know, Arlington 
has made a substantial, you know, substantial progress toward phosphorus yeah. reduction. But, you know, that said, I, I know, Matt, obviously there's been other stormwater treatment systems installed in town on a very much larger scale, some of the larger projects, and we've calculated phosphorus reduction associated um, with some of those projects as well. And that's been very substantial, just that we don't always have the space to do something like that, like we talked about. Yes, that's exactly, that's what I was going to add, that there has been historically um, investment in Winchester and green infrastructure, for sure. It's uh, a progressive community in this regard. I'll also just add that just reminded me obliquely that, you know, that this is nothing about this is unique to the Mystic River. Um, the Charles River has been, um, the Charles River watershed has um, uh very similar um, uh, uh, goals for phosphorus reduction that are currently part of the the stormwater permit for municipalities in the Charles. The, 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 there's nothing specific or local about this problem. It's a, it's a, that's why I started with the slide that said cities change rivers. It's really a, a side effect of urbanization and it's a problem where we're all grappling with all in certainly greater Boston and in, in every uh, kind of major city. So we did we did have one comment come in uh, mentioning a CSO and bacterial pollution um, in, in, in the Mystic Lake specifically. I'm wondering if we want to just comment briefly on some things that Mystic is doing around CSOs. I was going to ask you, Isaiah, whether you want to come. <laughs> I, I, Thanks, Isaiah. <laughs> I can say that CSOs is something that we're working on, in, and it's sort of uh, in in many ways uh, separate from from this uh, phosphorus reduction um, green infrastructure conversation. Um, but it certainly is, um, an, you know, an important source of of pollution in general um, it, 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 to the to the mystic, and so it's it's something that we're working on in other ways, and and. The thing about CSOs, and Andy, you can add context or correct me if I'm wrong here, sure. but it's it's a um, you know long term process for um, ultimately closing and 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 for those unaware, CSOs are combined sewer overflows, um, and uh, it is it's a complicated issue that if if you want to follow up with us about it, I'm happy to explain it further. But um, it really takes investment from from municipalities to uh, to to work on. Um, larger scale solutions than than um the 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 solutions that we're talking about here for phosphorus pollution um so oh you know ultimately separating combined sewer systems where the sewer and the stormwater go to the same place um but also looking at other um uh, other solutions such as uh long-term storage of stormwater so it's it's a it's a yeah it's a different it's a different conversation but it's one that the mystic river watershed is engaged with and, and many of the municipalities that we work with Andy, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, that's all exactly right. I'll, I'll just add that, that all the CSO um, neighborhoods in the Mystic Watershed are downstream of Winchester. There are no combined sewers, in the, as far as I know, in Winchester. Um, and so that it's really a, 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 a Cambridge, um, Somerville phenomenon. Ar Arlington is affected as well, but it, it's it's downstream. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but we're very actively, yeah, engaged in that issue as well. Thank you, Andy. I was just gonna say, I noticed two additional technical questions. One is, what is the ratio of water that's diverted to the infiltration trench and versus what goes to the river? So that's a, I, I, I'm really impressed at the questions tonight, actually, um, and, the, and the level of engagement, um, the number of folks who were able to, to join us and just, you know, some very good and detailed questions, some of which are, you know, stumping the instructors or the presenters. Um, for this, in this instance, I would say it really depends. It depends on the soils. If the soils are, the better the soil, the more infiltration you get, the more water it goes into this into the ground and not into the pipe and it also depends on the size of the system so the larger the system tends to be able to infiltrate more than uh, you know a smaller system obviously um, and as part of kind of the you know background calculations that uh, that uh, Weston and Samson will do is they will look at 
what the estimated phosphorus removal will be based on those types of characteristics. Thanks, Matt. And then I saw another one that was, do we have a baseline measure of the current phosphorus load from these targeted areas? Um, I was just going to say related to that. So like I had mentioned, so we did calculate the phosphorus load associated with each catchment area, which obviously helped us prioritize. But um, like Matt mentioned, in terms of, you know, calculating the, the phosphorus removal, we'll be looking at that at a more kind of detailed level, what the phosphorus contribution is and the, and the removal um, on a case by case basis for each infiltration trench. And that all of that data will be reported as part of kind of the, the wrap up for this, you know, entire project under this grant program. Thanks, Therese. And then I saw one final question, which is, what is the role of septic systems um, with phosphorus or maybe more like how does phosphorus um, loads or how are phosphorus loads impacted by septic systems? Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, obviously septic systems are, are definitely, it can be a contributing factor. Um, you know, it's something that we, you know, think about if we're developing, um, you know, a town-wide watershed-based plan or um, the contribution from, from, from septic systems. Um, I guess I was just saying, I know in Winchester alone, you guys don't have a lot of septic systems, I think, because actually the town does do some um, targeted educational mailing to properties with septic systems. And I believe that number is, I don't know if it's, definitely less than 20 probably in the teens I believe Matt yeah it's a very very small scale but um but no definitely definitely an issue in, in other communities especially that have septic systems around these kind of receiving receiving waters so I did this is my question obviously but I I actually you're right it's there's not that many in town but it turns out that like three or four of them of the 10 or 12 are between winter and wedge pond so I just so I can know in Lexington you can't sell your house. You couldn't sell it if you have a old septic. You have to connect to the town system to a system when you sell your house. But that's not true in Winchester, right? That if... well, I, I think the locations in Winchester may may be very isolated, right? And based on different site conditions, maybe it's not as feasible for them to tie I mean, into. I don't know about that. One is, or, is, one is the cemetery, you know. I yeah, think they could tie in, and one is a neighbor right here, you know, and. Winter Pond, and I don't think they could tie. So I don't know. I just was curious why we don't look at that more seriously. But there's no compelling requirement for the if you sell that home to change to do something, right? If that's correct, it's different than other towns. I'm not aware know. of yeah. uh, uh, of any requirements in Winchester, but I'm also right. not familiar enough with, with what other uh, communities do. Yeah, Lexington requires to you to. To convert, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I see another um, question in the chat, which I feel like is something that we were discussing recently. Um, Myra, why was the lake close to swimming so much last summer? Um, yeah, at the risk of giving bad information. I, I would say to ch uh, check in with the health department on that because I do believe they do some some testing there. Yeah, it you know it, what was closed was Shannon Beach, which is run by Department of Conservation and Recreation (DCR), and they closed um, the beach because of bacteria testing that they did in the water in a very wet summer. Mystic Lake is almost always um, meets water quality standards for swimming, except after big storms. And there was this series of big storms in um, in the middle of July and June, July, August of this last year. In any case, um, it's bacteria testing, which is a sign of sewage contamination upstream. Long story, um, we're actually grappling with that uh, and what what's likely to happen this summer as well. And so you feel free to email me. I can put my email in the chat uh, if you'd like more information. Ready. Um, I don't know if I missed any questions. Hmm. 
Does anyone have any additional questions that they would like to ask? Yeah, so I just, um, I know you, <laughs> I don't want to steal your thunder, thunder Marja, but uh, you are, we, this has been recorded. Uh, you will be posting it on, or you will be uploading it and then the town will post it on their web page. And I'm sure we can also post the presentations over the next couple of days. And uh, I think Isaiah just put uh, the web page address and the, the generic uh, engineering department email address. Uh, if there are any further questions or if a butter is listening in and has some specific questions and wants to touch base. Thank you for um, joining us for this meeting. Thank you for all the uh, engagement. This was you know, a really good group and we had some great questions and great discussion here. And we appreciate you all joining us. And like we said, if you have any additional questions that you want to ask the town, um, that information is in the chat as well as the project website. You can always message us at the Mystic River Watershed Association if you um, have any additional concerns. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you, Matt. Marcia. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, Isaiah. We appreciate it, Jonas. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. everyone.